I've actually done quite a bit of research about Bodhidharma as well, and this is true. And they've actually got three different people that they say Bodhidharma is a conglomeration of. And they have, the most recent reading I have is that one of them actually was a guy named Bodhidharma, who actually did go to the Shaolin Temple, but that's about all they have. Um, and that there was a document called The Two Entrances and Four Practices, that apparently was what he taught, even though we hear a lot about the, uh, the Lanka, the Dabara Sutra being. No, indeed. OK. So uh, I want to, first of all, I'd like to thank Roshi for inviting me to come and give a talk about uh, Zen and the martial arts. And my talk is actually going to be um, mostly early historical, um, because a lot of people uh, the, the stories that we hear about martial arts and Zen and um, so on that have come through time have been, you know, greatly exaggerated, expounded, mixed up, crossed over, confused, rewritten. Um, like most history, uh, history is written by the victors, you know, so consequently they leave out the, the bad stuff, you know, they, they want to make it sound good, you know, like... Like our American history talks about how wonderful Columbus was and how the col colonists have Thanksgiving dinner with the Indians and so forth, but we don't talk about the massacres and all that kind of stuff that happened. And it, oddly enough, Buddhist history is, is very similar. Um, all the bad stuff's sort of left out. You know, now, Wanji will probably mention the fact that uh, in China and Korea, for certain and documented, uh, the temples kept slaves. Um, and that was a practice up until the mid 18th century or early 19th century. So these are the types of things that history has tended to kind of whitewash and leave behind. Um, legend, we'll talk about the legend first. Um, you know, legendarily, it's said that um, Bodhidharma, uh, known in China as Damo, uh, brought the martial arts to China, to the Shaolin Temple. Um, and then from there, they spread out and became um, what we know today as the martial arts. <coughs> um, this is, you know, a legend that is probably uh, from the 17th century, you know, so quite a bit after the 480 when Bodhidharma was actually there. And it was um, said, I wrote a couple of notes here, the, the Muscle Change Classic and the Merrill Washing Classics were written in the 17th century. And those two documents is where that legend of Bodhidharma teaching martial arts to the Shaolin because the Shaolin monks, all they did was sit around and read sutras all day and meditate. And he came there and said, oh, you guys are getting fat and lazy. We need to you know, get you doing something. Now, <clears throat> there's absolutely no doubt that uh, Bodhidharma practiced martial arts, um, but the, the idea that he brought the martial arts to China and it was Kung Fu and the beginning of Kung Fu and all of that is much of the exaggerated, uh, rewritten history. Um, to really get into how the martial arts got incorporated into Buddhism and specifically Zen, we have to go back to the beginning of the Mahayana tradition. The Mahayana tradition, um, you know, uh, branched out when um, sutras went from being an oral tradition to a verbal tradition, or to a written tradition. And when it was, when it was changed to a written tradition, it really opened up Buddhism to a lot more people and a lot, a lot of scholars. And the new Mahayana tradition was really, really blossomed when, when this written material became available. Um, among the things that happened, and what you'll find, for example, in the Lotus Sutra, is that it was stated that the uh, practice of Buddhism was available for everyone and not just monks. Um, was one of, the, one of the grand openings of the Mahayana tradition was that people in everyday lives were also practitioners of uh, Buddhism, and that if you read the Lotus Sutra, there'll, there'll be multiple examples up there. And that's where the, the, um, the Mahayana, the big uh, vehicle tradition, came in, is that they, um, um, 
today, if, uh, if the Buddha were alive today, he'd probably use a train as an example, you know, where the, the, the great vehicle would be a, a, like a train, and the train is going to Nirvana or to the other shore, and all the different cars are all the different traditions, the way people practice different forms of Buddhism. There would be a car for everyone, you know, that would be in there. And uh, so the Mahayana tradition was opening up to everyone the concept of Buddhist practice. And among the everyones were people of nobility, people who were at that time the kings, the princes, the, you know, so on and so forth. The, you know, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha himself was royal blood. And, and, and royalty in those days, you know, he was, is these little kingdoms were like what we would call counties today. All these different kingdoms were little counties, and the king and his princes and, and, and their soldiers were in charge of maintaining the peace. And uh, someone like Shakyamuni Buddha, Siddhartha, would be trained in martial forms. Um, and mostly because you had to defend your, your kingdom, your county, your your area, you had to, that was part of your responsibility as a ruler, as a leader. And uh, from marauders and from uh, rival factions and, and other other uh, kingdoms that wanted to get larger and take over some of your territory, all those things came in. And these people had developed this martial art form and were adopting the new Mahayana tradition, which would allow them to be both Buddhists and soldiers and princes and, you know, carpenters and whatever, see. So a lot of these traditions sort of pooled together in the Mahayana that were not so common with the uh, Theravadan, the older tradition. See. Among the things that changed was uh, rules followed by the Vinaya in the Mahayana tradition. The Mahayana monks were allowed to have possessions and allowed to handle money. Um, this was a new change. Uh, the Theravadan monks weren't allowed to handle money. So, so you have these, these monks who are carrying cash. And they're also carrying possessions like golden statues. And they have things that are worth money to robbers to people who want to take those things and sell them on the market, whatever, you know. You know, pretty wild and woolly uh, time in history. And among these monks in the Mahayana tradition, which is why the Mahayana tradition spread into China and Tibet and into Mongolia and places like that, is along the Silk Road, the Mahayana monks started traveling. They were basically... Uh, ambassadors of Buddhism. Uh, they were almost uh, like, you know, like the, the Mormons come knocking on your door type thing. They were out and, and they weren't proselytizing, you know, in, a, in an outward way, but they were just kind of making themselves available so people would ask them, you know, these holy men coming, walking, walking from India, or walking from Tibet, or walking into China from Mongolia. So these Monks who are walking in the wilderness, in the wild, are carrying cash and goods with them as they go. And the robbers thought, what an easy target. We have these monks who are, you know, into peace and compassion and, and loving and caring with people. We could just go right up to them and say, give me your money. You know, pull the knife, pull the sword you know, whatever it takes to rob the monk. Well, I imagine for a while there was some serious uh, monk robbing going on, you know, that, that monks were getting robbed. And uh, they began catching on to this idea that uh, we don't want to get robbed. We don't want to get killed for our money, but we still have the money. We're carrying money. We're getting, we're collecting Donna. We're collecting money. So, they started developing a defensive fighting form. Not to injure, not to attack, not to uh, cause harm, 
but the other side of it, to stop an attack, to stop harm, harm to you, harm to the people you're with, so on and so forth. It's pretty uh, pragmatic, actually. You know, people will tell you that the Chinese especially are very pragmatic about things, you know. Um, a lot of times they hired uh, monks to do fortune telling, and if the monk's fortune telling wasn't accurate, they quit supporting that monk because his fortune telling didn't come true. Very pragmatic, things have to work. And among the things that have to work is that monks have to support themselves and they have to, you know, be there. Because China wasn't the same tradition as India. The idea of a bunch of people not getting married and having families and, and you supporting them wasn't really big in China. It, it, had to, it took quite a while to catch on. But the monks did begin collecting and these traveling monks carried their money and they started carrying a staff. Um, and, and this staff here, uh, which is in Japan is known as the Shakujo um, staff. In, um, in China, it's called the Chan staff, Chan as in Zen staff. And it's designed specifically for fighting robbers. That's what this staff was designed to do. The monks would walk along their trail with their jingling staff. And you've heard legends that, oh, this is to scare all the little animals away so that the monks won't step on them and hurt them. And that's, that's really a nice little story. But the truth of the matter is, is it's, I'm a monk who knows how to use this. Don't rob me. And the staff was developed as a fighting instrument to protect from swords and from knives. Because those of you who know the martial arts know that there's distances that have to be kept. And the distance from a sword is the reach of the sword. With sword fighting, you either have to get so close the sword can't be used, or so far away that you can't be struck. The length of this staff is purposely meant to fight somebody with a shorter weapon, the sword. And the end of the staff, the rings, were specifically designed for the idea that you would actually try to entangle the sword blade into these rings of staff as they were lunging the sword at you so that you could twist the staff and it would either break the sword just by leverage if he's holding on to the end or fling it through the air away from the attacker. Suddenly you have an attacker with no weapon, and you still have one, see. But monks weren't trying to hurt anybody. What they were really trying to do is stop the aggression, to stop the violence. And a lot of times, these robbers were pretty determined fellows. They would come at you with anything they had. So the design of this staff started picking up features that allowed the monk to continue to fight, an armed marauder or an unarmed marauder who wouldn't give up. And among the things is this little point on the end. Now this little point has a round tip and it's only about three quarters of an inch to an inch long. So uh, it's not very, let's say, fatal if it's used as a spear. It actually, the large ring and the hooks here actually stop it. So if you're coming at me and I'm defending myself as a monk, I don't want to kill you. I just want to stop you. And something that will stop you really quick is a three-quarter inch long prong stuck in between your ribs. It won't do any serious damage, but it'll hurt. And it'll hurt bad. And these little hooks on the side here, when it's rotated, will cause even more superficial pain. I mean, surface pain. Ow, that really hurts. <laughs> See? So the, the weapon was designed around defending yourself in a non-lethal way against someone who really didn't care if they killed you or not. They were after your money. They were after what you were carrying. Maybe you were carrying some other things that were belonged to the temple, you know, valuable golden statues or things that were expensive. So this staff 
became the mark of the wandering Mahayana monk. And there's all kinds. Is, is this Kishida Garba over here with the staff? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So the Kishida Garba, you, you show him with that staff, and his is even more ornate because some of them were actually, the cages were actually fairly large. And that cage was purposely the fighting technique, was learning how to use that cage to grab that sword, twist the staff, and fling the sword out of the, out of the battle scene, and disarm your assailant. And from there, it was either staff fighting or hand fighting, and usually the monk was an excellent fighter with the staff. In fact, the early monks in this tradition carried all the way through the Silk Road, all the way to Europe, and the Catholic monks who traveled also learned how to fight the staff. And those of you who are familiar with Robin Hood and Friar Tuck know about Friar Tuck and fighting with the staff. This was a technique because the staff is basically, I mean, even though it can be a lethal weapon, it was originally intended to be a non-lethal weapon to fight armed foes and to, you know, show them that you don't want to be attacking me because I know what I'm doing. I know why I'm carrying this. So this tradition of the Chan staff is actually the oldest martial arts tradition in China. In fact, there are, uh, there are um, uh, historical documents from the period. They're called steels. They're, they're carvings that are usually done in stone. Sometimes they're done in bronze. And they've actually dated battles between Chan monks and marauders using the Chan stuff. And this is all documented from about 400 on to about 700 uh, AD. And there's, they're all over China. And if you want to look up the historical steels, you can. There's some very good books that are written. There's a lot of nonsense written about the Shaolin Temple. Um, but there's some very good historical books. And, and um, one of them in particular that I can't remember the name of, and I can probably send you the information. But it is a man who went there totally disbelieving all the things he had heard about the Shaolin. And he wrote what he could document from historical records from the period what was actually happening. And he made some interesting discoveries. First of all, the first fighting technique of the monks was the staff. The staff outdated all other martial arts techniques by nearly 100 years that he could tell from his research. Also, all the monks were trained at this. It was part of their discipline and their their tradition, part of their um, part of their practice, and part of it, going back to the legend of Bodhidharma and the monks, you know, doing nothing but sitting around and reading sutras and uh, sitting meditation. Part of that may be true that they carry on this tradition of of uh, you know fighting with the staff and everything, not just for self defense, but for exercise, for aerobics. Um, when uh, when uh, Fa Jing and I uh, were in uh, Japan several years ago, my original Japanese teacher is in the lineage of Amori Sogen. And uh, we practice at a temple there, and they practice a technique with, with wooden swords, um, a boken, um, and it's called the, the, hodo, the hojo, where we stand around and do this heavy breathing count with striking the swords and we do it in a circle and everybody counts off and goes around and it's about a 20 minute exercise that we would do every single day as part of our stay. And this tradition has been, you know, come through, especially the Chan or the Zen tradition, as part of the standard fare of these traditions. Now a lot of this was lost when two things happened. One was is when the the two kingdoms became united in China and wars sort of backed off and, and law sort of law and order started you know taking over. Um, there were a lot less people robbing people and a lot less marauders going around attacking the Wild West. And people were getting attacked all the time. So these monks who were traveling and sort of gathering up in groups around these villages had an interesting uh, situation. They would come and they'd say, oh, here's a good place for a temple. There's a village here to support us. There's farmland for us to grow food. We, we could set up right here. 
But as I mentioned before, the Chinese are very pragmatic people. And when you say, we're going to build a temple right here and you're going to support us, the people in town are going, oh yeah? What are you going to do for us? Right? What are you going to do for us? So what did the Chan monks do for them? They went in town, and in the town square, they did a show. We're going to show you. They had the drums, they had the bells, they had the gongs, they did a ceremony and a service, and among the things they demonstrated was the martial arts. Fighting with the staff, fighting freehand kung fu, all types of fighting methods, doing somersaults, you know, the real, I mean, we're talking the Shaolin, if you've seen the Shaolin on television, that is nothing new, and in fact, the Shaolin are the only Chan monks who have carried on that tradition. It is the oldest tradition in China. The Shaolin Temple was the first temple in China that was a Chan or Zen temple. And this tradition has been carried on with them, but these other temples that have gone through time, and especially the ones that have developed since the unification of northern and southern China, have not carried on this fighting tradition. And in the big cities, they didn't do it at all, because they're right in where there's law and order. See? So we, we kind of laugh nowadays about the Shaolin and their, their fantastic fighting forms and all their beating or their drums and their performing. But this was the way back then that a group of monks would convince the villagers, you really want us here and you want to support us. Not only can we offer you spiritual guidance and so forth, but we can help defend your village. We're your, um, your uh, guards. We're, your, we're like the National Guard for the local village. We're your garrison. And this is honestly what, what got certain villages to say, we want these guys, especially if they've been recently robbed and burned and their fields attacked. You know, if you had a hundred monks there who knew how to use these staffs against marauders, odds were you wouldn't have to face another uh, pillage of your village. So this, this tradition really did come with the Mahayana traveling monks who had to defend themselves in the first place. And then this idea of now we have something to offer these village people too. We have this whole package that goes all the way from the spiritual tradition and the Zen Buddhist practice to we can help defend the village. And this, this history, by the way, is fully recorded on the steels in China. You can find it, and it's all over China. It's not just the Shaolin, especially in western uh, China, um, in, the, in the outlands and so forth, all of the temples out there. There's recordings of all these battles between monks and marauders. And they record the battle, and how many monks were killed, and how many uh, marauders were killed, and whether they won or lost. See? But this history has been kind of whitewashed and buried, because we're, we're supposed to be loving, compassionate monks. We don't fight in war. Uh, Brian uh, Victoria has written a book, Zen at War. It talks about all the stuff about the Japanese getting involved in the war effort in World War II, and it's all true, all every bit of it, but it's not new. It's not something new. It's not something that all of a sudden happened in Japan that all of a sudden we have this bunch of warrior monks. Warrior monks go all the way back to the beginning of the Mahayana tradition. The uh, founding monk, and I, I had to write down the names because I forget them, but uh, the photo was the um, F O T U O. Um, his uh, his uh, Indian name was Buddha Habhadra. Was the uh, founding abbot of the um, Shaolin Temple, and uh, he is the reason why Bodhidharma went to the Shaolin Temple because Bodhidharma had just gotten into some sort of interaction with Emperor Wu and got booted out of the city. And he was looking for a place to stay. And he knew he had a fellow countryman who was the head of this temple. 
and he went there, and it's not certain when or how it transpired, but Bodhidharma got booted out, like, get the heck out. And it was probably because he was a pretty radical dude, you know? And he, he ended up, you can stick around, but get out, get out of the temple. So he went and stayed in this cave. And a lot of the monks there would go visit with him because they saw him as a good teacher. Now, all these other legends and stuff about Bodhidharma, it's very, very hard to pinpoint any of it. But the, the idea that Bodhidharma went there and got booted out is fully documented. It was like they didn't, those two monks did not agree on the approach to teaching Zen at all, and, or Buddhism at all. And so Bodhidharma sort of started off with this kind of um, uh, infamous beginnings, you know, his, his discussion with Emperor Wu about no merit, you know, uh, who is this before me, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's like, well, what kind of, what kind of Buddhism are you bringing here? And, and uh, Fotao was probably just the opposite. He was probably very quiet, you know, oh, you know, emperor, come welcome, you know, bring your money and bring your friends and, you know, everything's fine. So there's kind of this clash going on. But this, this idea of the martial tradition and of fighting monks and of carrying the staff is very real, very true. It's from the very beginning of the Mahayana tradition. Almost all of the Chan temples between about 400 and 700 practiced the fighting staff and offered themselves as garrisons to the villages that were supporting them. It was only after about 700 that law and order started taking over and then people started mellowing out. And many of the temples carried on the tradition and the most famous of which is the Shaolin temple. And to this day, we now have the Shaolin acrobats who do these wonderful flights through the air and teach, you know, show us Kung Fu. And all of the, all the monks that come out of those temples become Kung Fu teachers all over. And, and I know that this spread, spread into to Korea and Japan. And I'm not sure about Vietnam. I don't know enough about the Vietnamese they have Kung Fu. tradition. Huh? They have Kung Fu. They have Kung Fu yeah. as well. So um, this is kind of the, the dark history, you know, the skeleton in the closet that a lot of modern uh, Buddhist teachers don't like to talk about. And when it comes out in uh, actual accurate histories about the Shaolin or actual accurate histories uh, about the Japanese in World War II, as in Victoria's books, you'll find that people get all... So yeah, so the, the law and order that came to China was really the thing in the larger city temples where people didn't have to defend themselves and where monks didn't have to defend themselves actually is when it really started uh, softening and less martial arts were incorporated by monks and practiced by monks and so forth. And the Shaolin just sort of carried on this tradition. And the Shaolin, by the way, have been broken up and re put together a number of times. I'm not even certain the temple now is even the same temple was the original one that was put together. Um, it's hard to tell because, like I said, history is always written by the victors and by the people who want it to sound a certain way. And this whole idea of, of uh, monks being total pacifists works in a society where it's a pa where everything's cool and everybody's mellow, you know. But when war is the order of the day, the monks are involved. In, and again, as, as Roshi brought up, defending the other people. A lot of the monks lost their lives defending villages from marauders. That was, that was their duty, you know, and, and, and it was what helped them uh, show the villagers that they should support the monastery and the monks being there. The hopes always were that there would be no attackers, that, that just having the monks there and walking around with these staffs was enough of a display, plus the occasional maybe New Year's Day demonstration of the monks doing their Kung Fu demonstration in the town square, would show all the marauders and robbers in town, no, we don't want to be messing with those guys, see? Because most robbers are not trained in the martial arts. They're thugs, 
You know, all they know how to do is club and draw a sword or pull a knife. And there are some more professional fighters like the Marauders who would go along like Genghis Khan and those guys who were fighters. But, you know, the, you'd sort of match your foe, you know. And so uh, when, when those guys came, there was a serious battle that would happen. And maybe all the monks would get killed. Or maybe they would win and they would defeat the marauders and the village would say hooray and then there'd be a big party, you know. But this this is this is the real tradition, the real uh, story of how martial arts became part of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Buddhism early on, as it came with the traveling monks. Then it became a, a practical thing about guarding their temples. Then it became, hey, we could demonstrate this to the villagers and they'll see that we can protect them so we can protect the entire village. And this carried on for quite some time until things started getting civilized. Just like in the Wild West in America, everybody carried a gun because the, the bad guys would come after you. And the nearest sheriff was in you know, Missouri or, or you know, Kansas City. And, and that's three days away by horse. Okay. Same thing. Only there it was the monks. Yeah. So anyway, um, I was uh, later. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to try to film it. I was going to show a couple of moves with the staff, um, with the, especially the short staff, since we have a couple of gentlemen here carrying short staffs. I was going to show a couple of things for that that uh, might uh, benefit you all later if you ever want to decide to uh, defend yourself against an attacker. Um, and the short staff works very well as well, the four-foot staff. Uh, the long staff, of course, the longer staff is better for weapons because if they have a sword that's typically a katana is 41 inches long from the tip of the, of the sword to the hilt, and a, and a Chinese sword is a 38 inches long from the tip of the sword to the, to the hilt at that point. And so they're, you know, you got to have a stick that's longer than that. So you fight. This one's actually kind of wimpy because they've become more ceremonial. The staffs before were made out of a wood called wax wood, which is a very good fighting wood, and they're quite a bit heavier, probably half again bigger diameter than this, and then the rings were quite a bit larger. So anyway, the shakujo or the chan staff was the first martial arts weapon uh, and the first really monk martial art. It was really that. And the Kung Fu, the freehand style, um, and the uh, Karate, the, you know, those are later styles that developed as, as time went by. So that's my talk.